So good morning. Uh, my name is Gail Hurley and I'm from the Connecticut State Library Division of Library Development and I want to welcome you all to our workshop of this morning, which is one of our many um, Growing Equitable Library Services or GELS series. And today's workshop is GELS Creating a Trauma-Informed Library Environment. And we're very happy to welcome back with us Beatrice Della Espriella to continue this trauma-informed series. Uh, so Beatrice is a licensed clinical social worker and mental health expert in anxiety, stress, and trauma. She works with individuals and libraries to improve the mental health and well-being of library staff so they can feel empowered to serve their community and thrive professionally and uh, personally. She provides training and coaching to libraries on trauma-informed services, mindfulness, self-care, and more. Beatrice developed a trauma-informed services professional development curriculum that highlights the prevalence of trauma and provides library staff with essential skills to recognize and respond to trauma. She launched the Empowered, Confident, and Thriving, a mental wellness program for library staff that focuses on promoting mental well-being by practicing self-care, building resilience, and gaining the tools and strategies needed to navigate life's challenges. Beatrice earned her MSW from Rutgers University and her trauma-informed professional certification from Barry University. So welcome, Beatrice. Thank you. Thank you, Gail, for having me. And welcome to everyone new who I have not seen or met before, um, but also welcome uh, back to those who have been with me in these uh, webinar series. So like Gail mentioned, we are going to be talking about creating a trauma-informed environment. Um, before we get started, I just kind of want to have a moment to arrive to a safe place. Hey, we're going to talk about environment. What a best time to talk about arriving to a safe place. And what I mean by that is take a moment to kind of let go of any distractions that you have right now. Take a moment to acknowledge maybe something that happened earlier this morning that just got to you and you've been thinking about it over and over again and you kind of need a moment to center and ground yourself. I want you to practice being present because it is such a powerful tool for us. So go ahead and take a moment to take a deep breath in and out. Now I know some of you might be in areas where you're unable to like close your eyes or don't feel comfortable, that's okay. See if you can find yourself an object that you can focus on. And again, just arrive to the safe place and let go of anything that has been um, taken over you this morning. Maybe somebody cut you off in traffic or anything like that. So go ahead and take a deep breath in and out. One more time, take a deep breath in and out. Perfect. All right, let's go ahead and jump right in. So for today, we are going to do a quick overview of trauma-informed care. Now, the past two webinars, I went really in to what trauma-informed care is, um, but this time I'm not around, I'm not going to go too much into it. I understand, and I know Gail has access to those recordings for those that have not, haven't received them um, or haven't had a chance to attend those trainings. Um, so, but this, again, if there's anybody new, I just kind of want to do a quick overview, and then we're going to jump around and talk about the library environment overall, and then I'm going to close it up with some Q&As. So the first thing I want to do is a quick definition of what trauma is, and we are going to be defining trauma as an event, series of events, or set of circumstances that is experienced by an individual is either a physical or emotionally harmful, but the most important thing that I want you to take care of this or take with you when it comes to trauma is that lasting adverse effect that it has on the individual's functioning. So we're talking about their mental functioning, their physical, social, emotional well-being, even their spiritual well-being as well. So something happened to them that has impacted them, and now it's having effects on who they are. Some examples are trauma, adult trauma, trauma of poverty, emotional, sexual, sexual assault, even physical assault. Um, and and then there's this thing called adverse childhood experiences, and these are potentially traumatic events that happen during childhood, so those ages between 0 to 17 years old, and they are linked, these events and situations that happened 
actually linked to chronic health problems that an individual can experience later in life. So it's an individual who has experienced constant uh, trauma, constant stress, that constant exposure, it's linked to those chronic health problems as the individual grows up. So one of the things that I wanted to focus when it comes to trauma-informed services and trauma-informed services is this idea of realizing, recognizing how prevalent trauma is, but most importantly, it's avoiding re-traumatization. So what does re-traumatization even look like? So this slide um, does a perfect example. It's not mine. I don't own it. Um, but I just kind of wanted to be able to share this with you. So um the re-traumatization within the system is having to, you know, having to continually tell, retell the story. So that is an example of being re-traumatized, being threatened and uh, treated as a number, um, you know, in relationships, not being seen, violating their trust, right? So a trauma-informed approach looks at avoiding these re-traumatizations tra re of the individual. And that's what this uh, trauma-informed care approach looks into. So I definitely, again, suggest you go back to those uh, trainings that I did so you can get more information. But I wanted you to get this particular slide because we're going to be talking a lot about avoiding re-traumatization with regards to the environment that the individual might be in. All right. So let's go ahead and take a moment to share and what I would like to do. So a couple things with the chat. I would love to get engagement. I would love to hear from everyone. So please, please, um, please be comfortable using the chat. Um, and also with questions, if I don't get to them in, in during the presentation, I definitely would get them towards the end. So what I want you to do now is I want you to think of a place that makes you feel comfortable. So go ahead and bring, I already got mine in my head, um, or a place that makes you feel safe, just comfortable, safe. What does it look like, right? What does it include? What does it smell like? So go ahead and type in the chat and I'm going to pull it up really quick. I want you to share with me, what does that safe place look like? So I'm going to share with you. I have my, um, actually my bedroom. There's this little corner that I have where I have a chair and um, I wish I had a, lot, a lamp that I can like have next to me, um, but I just have this cozy blanket and I have some books on a table and that corner right there is such a safe place for me. So go ahead and type in the chat, what, what do you consider to be a safe, comfortable place for you? And I know some of you are working and unable to participate. So I totally understand. So if you're able to, please share. Living room couch. Okay. Jennifer, do you mind sharing a little bit more? What makes your living room couch so comfortable and cozy? Is there something about it that you like? I don't want to put you on the spot, but I think it would be great if you could share a little bit more. All right. So definitely we all have certain places that we feel comfortable, certain places that um, are making us, you know, feel safe. And we all have those. And I understand a lot of you are working right now, so unable to share. So the idea of having this in our mind, whenever we're implementing a trauma-informed, creating a trauma-informed library environment is to start thinking about some of those things that we feel are comfortable for us so that we can work to help those uh, individuals within our own environment. So in order to develop a trauma-informed environment, we need to ensure we follow these principles. And I go into much, much detail than the last two um, webinars, but the principles of safety, trustworthiness, and transparency, collaboration, empowerment, voice, and choice. Um, and these right here are some of the principles that we really want to focus on um, when we're creating that library environment place. Um, I guess I mentioned I'm not going to be going over these principles specific, um, but we are going to be touching uh, into these specifically as we move forward.
It is also important to create trust and caring and responsive relationships with people we serve, as well as using inquiry surveys or even plain conversations to kind of get an idea of what some of the things individuals like in our environment at the library and maybe some potential triggers. Like we want to look into what would be something that potentially be re-traumatizing to somebody, some, something that could be, um, let's think of try to ways to avoid them getting re-traumatized for something that it is within our library. The most idea I want you to kind of get in the back of your mind is when we're creating a trauma-informed library environment is that we need to understand the per say, pervasive nature of trauma, and we want to promote an environment that has healing, it has an environment of recovery, rather than practicing and services that may re-traumatize the individual. So with that being said, um, is oh okay all right so jennifer it's blue and cushy has a big picture window i can look at the bird feeder from i have my favorite books in my entertainment center right nearby thank you so much for sharing thank you so there's something about it that makes it comfortable so once again just have that in the back of your mind as we're doing the presentation so there's something i want you to have there's a definition that uh, a topic that has been increasing a lot and this idea of trauma-informed design. So the physical environment in the places that we go and attend. Trauma-informed design is about integrating the principles of trauma-informed care or trauma-informed services into design with the goal of creating physical spaces that promote safety, well-being, and healing. Right. This re re requires realizing how physical environment affects the identity, worth and dignity and how it promotes empowerment. So there's tons of new research that's being implemented that is not just about the relationships that we have with individuals that we need that need to be trauma informed but also the environment and the way we design things uh, um, within the, uh, the environment that we're in, right? So this type of design focuses on the importance of that physical environment with that trauma approach. Um, so for me, I think it's super powerful, right? That we're just not looking um, at the policies of it or just the training of staff, but we're also looking at our physical building and how can we impact the, how the changes that we make can definitely impact in a good way the individuals that we serve. So let's talk a little bit about this physical environment. So the physical environment, when I mention, when I talk about, we're talking about the noise. Um, it could be that noise or smell that can trigger a feeling of being unsafe um, or even elicit a, a reaction. I don't know if sometimes, you know, like darker places may make you feel um, uneasy. So in this situation, we, um, we want to look into finding ways to avoid those triggering situations. So, but again, we might look and think, well, how do I know? How do I know that this particular building or part of our building is unsafe for some? You know, we don't all experience trauma the same way. And that goes with collaboration. Once again, as I mentioned to you earlier, these key principles are the ones that we're going to be working with. And they're very, very important. Collaboration being number one. So here is where you include patrons in your assessments, right? You include them in the evaluation of the services that you have. You want to hear from them, hear from the community members. What do they have to say, right? And sometimes we can't really accommodate everyone. And I, I totally understand. We can't please every single individual that walks into the building, but we can try to accommodate some or few, or especially those that are more use use more your services in your environment so let's go ahead and take a, a moment and look about this place so how does this environment make you feel what are some of the areas uh that you would change or improve so go ahead and use the chat and i'll take some time sip of my coffee um but what would be something that when you look at this environment you look at this place um what do you think makes you feel? To me, it made me feel like I uh, went to a doctor's office once and it was just like that. And I was just like, oh, icky, kind of dirty looking. Um, but what are some thoughts? What are some of the things that make you feel? What could you change? Looks very clinical and uninviting. Yes. Claustrophobic and overstimulating. 100%. Pick up the trash. Yes Stale. Temperature looks hot. Yes. All the way to the top. There wasn't like even a second. Even the colors to me, 
even the colors, like the carpet and, and just the colors in general uh, makes it look uninviting. Um, there's too much going on um, in this, this space right here. So what about this one? How does this particular place, how does this one make you feel that in this environment right here? Move the sitting to in a small groups or something not like it. I like the plant. Yes, yes. So and K, perfect. Like being able to move that space, like the seating, um, makes a total difference. Just kind of like open, friendly, warm, bright. There's even a difference in the sink, the picture frame. Like we had this, I don't know what that is. Circles, square, triangles, um, kind of picture that we have going on. And um, I, I don't want to name my library, but I love my library, by the way. But there's this random picture that I and there's nothing It's a huge wall. And it's just like a random picture in there. And I, as an artistic person, would love to just take that picture down and just have like kids pictures or something else. This is a little bit more inviting. It even has the word welcome. The change of its scenery just definitely makes a difference. Soothing. Thank you, Jennifer. Soothing. It's like it smells clean. The first one seems like it smells musty. Jessica, cleaner, safe for children, a space for children. Yes, absolutely. So we're looking at that. And even there's another part of it. Uh, let me go back to it really quick. This computer area where the individuals are working from, the way the monitor is placed, it's just kind of like, I don't know, it just doesn't seem just the position of everything. Like this is more you know, personal, we're, you know, working, it's my workspace. Um, it's closed off from everyone, anyone else coming in, love the greenery, go love the plant. Um, and then even the temperature, um, I love the person who, who highlighted the temperature part. The temperature is definitely much more comfortable and much more. So, um, welcoming. So I know it might sound silly and we have a, you know, simple images in here, but we can definitely see the difference in how important our physical environment is. So, and we always don't have the funding. We may not have the funding available to make a huge revamp, but I am very well aware that, you know, there is ways for us to maybe change a few pictures or just kind of arrange the way seats are, are in a place. Um, there's a particular corner in my library that I get a little iffy about, um, and like I said, this, you know, big wall that just has this random picture in the middle. Um, but just taking a moment, just walk one of these days into your library, but don't start noticing things from the door. Go backwards. So we're so used to seeing things every single day. And we walk it into the building, we walk into those doors and we see things exactly how they are. This time around, I want you to take a walk, but I want you to do it the opposite way and see if there's something else you notice and maybe there's something that we can change. So how would this look into your, um, you know, into your library? You know, we're looking at uh, staff are open and honest and offer support. Again, we're talking about physical environment, but this welcoming environment also includes staff. Um, you know, the environment is not geared to one particular group. Um, there's inclusiveness, welcoming to all, as in, in the picture, there's a section for children, just a small little table, not too many toys, nothing crazy, but just something for, for them to be included. Um, avoid posters, it voice posters or images that could potentially be re-traumatizing. So take a look at that um, and be aware, aware like diverse clients and see if there's any way that we can provide some level of accommodations. All right, so how does this image make you feel? Let's go ahead and use the chat for a bit. Peaceful. Mm -hmm. You got a thumbs up for peaceful. Mm -hmm. Me is like the serene place. Uh, it makes me think of uh, Bob Ross, I think, or something when he does the thing, but um, very calming, very soothing, um, very welcoming and open. So the use of art, um, when we think of using art, we want to look at maybe landscape paintings and landscape areas or outdoors areas, uh, areas, because those are associated 
with an increased positive effect and comfort. So the more we use nature scenery, um, I mean, as, as a therapist, one of the things that I always recommend my clients, if you're having struggle with something, go take a walk, go outside, go take a walk, go into nature, notice the sounds, be outside. So that is important. But if we're inside in a building, how can we bring that nature inside? So if we use art, you know, we want to be able to bring that nature and that calm into the space, right? So we, when we're thinking of art, I don't want you to think of art that it's going to be too strong um, or that it's going to have some negative feelings. So when you're looking at it, ask yourselves, like, what is something that uh, this, how does it make me feel and how can it make others feel? So again, we're looking at how would this look in your library, those specific environments, you know, in your furniture, we want to rearrange furniture to consider feelings of safety and perceived crowdedness. So in the first image, if you can think there is the chairs facing each other, when we move them, you know, like in the L shape, you know, it gives us an opportunity for individuals to come in and be in flow and not necessarily cloud, you know, crowded and enclosed. Um, definitely allow an area where furniture can be rearranged and allow independence and a sense of control. So, and I wrote here out of patio because sometimes we don't want patrons to be moving chairs around because it can get disruptive. It can get loud. It can get noisy. Um, but, but having the opportunity to do that, I think it's very important. Um, understanding boundaries, creating signs that indicate, you know, where things need to be placed, um, you know, making sure that they return them to those places, um, thinking about lighting, li the lighting as well, it's very important. So is there a buzzing that's happening? You know, that could definitely trigger an individual as well. Um, is there a humming or a flickering? Any of those things could be programmatic. And again, how do we know? Um, we just kind of sit ourselves in the shoes of an individual who may have experienced some traumatic events. And if we do have windows, we more as importantly, one of my favorite libraries has this like open big window space um, that it's just wonderful, but we don't always have that opportunity. So again, we want to look at maybe at the colors and that's what I'm going to talk about next. Um, there it is, Carolyn, you got perfect right into it. Having neutral colors and uh, versus loud colors in the library. So we have plenty of room to move and clear exits. Perfect. So that is my my next step. So if we don't have windows, right? Because again, yes, that's a perfect scenario, but let's be honest, like not every single library has a window available to them for natural light to come in. So we jump into colors. So we want to avoid those warm colors, right? So this, some people might look at these colors as like the earthy colors, um, but instead we don't want those warm colors. We want the cool colors. And these are the greens, the blues, even the light purples and things like that. And these are more soothing and calm in nature. Um, they're not overpowering. They tend to kind of like open up that space. Um, so it makes the space like larger, even if you're like in a small environment, you know, just using whites is also very important. Um, greens and blues, the calming waters and things like that. So um, especially if you do have to use the warmer colors, try to avoid them in smaller spaces. I think that would be, um, there's another one. I know there's confusion of using, um, and again, I'm not saying go ahead and paint a green wall. I'd rather you do white, um, but the accents, we definitely want them to be on a much lighter color on those greens, um, greens and blues, grays, a lot of the times are used because they it's not so much white. So then we have some grays and that helps a little bit. Um, but it's also that feeling of sterile. So we need to be cautious with those, um, how we use that as well. So perfect example. This is what I move next. How does this environment make you feel? Let's go ahead and use the chat really quick. How does that environment make you feel? That used to, that reminds me of my, um, so for anyone in academic library right now, that reminds me right there of uh, a computer lab that I used to go to. Um, and I remember sitting very close to the door because that was where the light was in instead of sitting towards the back. Um, let's see, tired, like a clock in a wheel. Yes, 
Like I would get in trouble if I moved incorrectly. Very, yes, very impersonal, 100%. So these are the kind of environments that are not welcoming. Um, again, we are very limited in how we can move things around. Um, but for those that are able to make decisions in your environment, your library setting, I definitely th would feel like I would get in trouble if things get like moved, if not possible. So is there any way to be flexible? So this what about this one? Like, again, there's still chairs, it's still darker colors, but what is the difference between this one and the other one? What are some of your thoughts? And I love the phones uh, on this picture. Feels fresher, more alive. And the difference, natural woods and plants, natural colors and finishes, correct. So the other picture, there's windows. You know, and I talked about natural windows, uh, natural, you know, the natural light. Um, but it's so like synthetic also light. Like I feel like it's so sterile that when we go to this one, we still have some windows. There's some shading on the top, but there's still some more natural lighting. But I think that using even the browns and the dark colors, the fact that we have the greenery makes a difference. And I feel like this is not as crowded because there's not so much stuff. There's, it's just so blank. And this one might be a little bit crowded because, you know, you have certain areas that are stuff going on, but just the openness of like different colors and in and, and the greenery, the softer lighting, 100%. We went from that bright, whatever that was, um, color to then something a little bit different and something lighter. So this is where I want you, again, you know, look into, this would be my ideal library if we can do something like that, but um, how would this look in your library once again? So we want to have those plants, you know, to be able to bring that nature into the environment. Um, they promote peace, tranquility, you know, like that need of self-esteem of let, let's go ahead um, and be warm and cozy together, right? And that we want to be able to have that connection uh, with individuals and how, what is the best way to do that if allowing them and making them feel comfortable that they can come and walk into our library and feel okay and feel welcomed. All right, before I move on, I wanna do a quick check-in. Any questions, comments, or thoughts um, that anyone has right now before I move on? All right. And again, you're more than welcome to keep, you know, writing onto on the chat um, if you do have questions as we go along. All right. So how do we assess if our library environment is, in fact, welcoming and um, how can we look into and, and sit with our team and say, hey, I think we should look at our environment because there may be some non-safe places in here. So these are some of the questions that you may want to ask yourself. And I, I will say this, all of you will get copies of the slides, so you don't have to start writing all of this down, but I want you to start thinking about it. So does the physical environment of the library promote a sense of safety, calming, and de-escalation for clients and staff? And I want you to think about this answer. It's not just a question for staff. It says de-escalation for clients and staff or patrons and staff, right? But I don't think the staff should be the only one answering this question. I think it would be important to build a relationship with individuals that come into the library and ask them that particular question. Is the library working with patrons to develop strategies to the to address, address re-traumatization? So these this is some of the things that we could do, some of the questions that we can ask. Are there potential for connection with the natural world? Meaning, is there a way that our library can have an, an, an area where if an individual feels unsafe walking into this building, but still needs our resources, they're able to be outside, but not gone of the building. I don't know if there's a way to, way to either bring in the outdoor place for us or enclose it in a way. So it's like a little patio or garden that we're able to do. Um, maybe if your library doesn't have the funds, connect with another agency a uh, local agency that can provide some of the funding to arrange an area that it's calming and soothing so that if you can't really bring it inside, but they can go outside and enjoy that environment, I think that would be very beneficial. Another thing um, I want to 
think about or just kind of like have in the back of your mind is that trauma awareness, like being aware of um, how much we have trained individuals. So again, when we are assessing, is our library providing or creating a trauma-informed environment, we need to be providing education. We need to be providing training to our staff. Um, we need to be addressing in some level organizational change in order to create this environment. It's not sufficient to just rearrange some seeds and put up some posters and pictures and call it a day. I think it has to be a continuous effort of being aware of what trauma effects has, um, continue training uh, and connecting with other resources and individuals to continue growing and creating the space again for healing and supporting those individuals um, that have experienced trauma. One thing I want you to keep in mind is this thing called vicarious trauma and the importance of self-care. Um, my biggest thing is if you are going to be talking about trauma-informed services and creating a trauma-informed environment, it's very important that you also allow a space for your staff to process anything that they themselves have experienced. And also, let's say they go to a staff member, I'm sorry, a staff member goes to a patron and says, hey, we're trying to change things around. We're trying to open this garden area and we want to know if this will be a safe place for you. What do you think? And then all of a sudden this patron, who you have a relationship with, opens up and tells you their own trauma experience. And they say, well, I'm glad that you asked because when I was a child, all of these things happened and X, Y, and Z. And then now you have received all these feelings and you have received all these emotions of what this person went through. How are you going to take care of yourself? How are you going to move past that and being able to process it in a way that it doesn't affect you and it doesn't affect your work. So I think that's one of the two things that I want you to keep in mind whenever we're working on creating this library environment, um, being able to keep in mind of how are you going to take care of yourself as well. Another part of library environment that I think it's very important um, that, you know, we just kind of touch in um, is this idea of safety. Um, so once again, it goes back to those principles that I want you to keep in mind of. So look at the physical and emotional safety of the library, look at the potential triggers, um, and this importance of choice, the thought of being able to choose, um, and it's very important. So allowing individuals to do you want to work in an in an area where it's just you? Um, I think my library has a very good way of choosing. Um, there's tables where I can work, sit next to other people, um, which I would never do because I'm very, you know, very particular of my space. But there's also an area where there's only one chair and it's big enough a table and it's kind of closed off to anyone else. And I feel the privacy right away. So I'm able to choose which of the two sitting spaces I can I can have. Um, and then there's another library where most of the sitting spaces is just open space. So I choose to go to the library that has that option for me, one or the other, where I have the privacy versus the library that has a very open space. So I think this idea of choosing is super and super important whenever we're looking at that library environment um, and thinking of the importance of, of choosing and allowing the individual to choose instead of us choosing for them. Um, okay, so I wanted to bring in a quick example of a trauma-informed approach when it comes to um, a library environment. So let's say the challenge is chairs in the lobby are too close together, location of the building could be locked doors that slam or require buzzers to get through. Like this would be, uh, these could be some potential trauma-informed or trauma triggers. Um, and a non-trauma-informed response would be, uh, we have a limited budget, so we have limited space, um, you know, we have old, you know, used furniture and it's the norm. Our decor has nothing to do with, with how individuals feel. Uh, building sites can't be controlled, you know, doors locked for safe, you know, safety of staff. Like we totally understand um, if the challenge in this situation, oh, very sorry, my mouse decided to freeze up in a minute. So in this situation, um, how would we switch it into a trauma-informed approach? So we have this environment that is challenging for us and the trauma, non-trauma informed response is, well, 
that's just what it is. We're not going to be able to deal with it. How can we deal with it? How can we address it? Right. So in this situation, I'm um, sorry, let me move by. Okay. So in this particular example, if we have a challenging environment, like again, chairs in the lobby, you know, they're too close to each other. Like what can we do? So let's look at trauma related explanation or a trauma education statement. What we know about trauma is that experiences of hypervigilance can cause increased sensitivity to environmental factors um, that I may not notice, but another person might. So the sounds or the slamming of the doors, you know, requiring a buzzer to get into one place or the other. Um, and this might feel like if an individual has been in jail, this might feel like very survival mode, kind of like I need to respond in a way that it's not safe for me. Um, being close to others may just, you know, cause stress and discomfort. So what are some of the strategies that we could do? Um, is there any way that we can identify what those triggers might be? Um, is there any way we can um, ex expand the space? You know, is there a way to do, have access to those exits? You know, in this particular one, I said in here, doors locked for safety for staff. I think it's very important. I do want to keep that in mind. The safety is a number one priority for me. Um, so if your safety, you know, there's places that need to be locked, it's great. We just kind of want to be mindful it's of the signage and be able to have enough signs so that the individual say staff only so that it's not, you know, something that we're trying to prevent anyone from, from doing other than just like, this is a staff only kind of place, um, you know, being able to have sign, you know, signs where individuals say, well, this is towards the exit. This is children's only room or whatever it might be. This is for uh, private study area. So being able to have it like very, there's open signs to everything, I think it will be a huge strategy and a huge way to address, um, you know, that, that sense of not feeling safe. Um, any questions about this? The quick example that I just had. All right. So one of the things that I wanted, I really want to open up to um, some questions because the last few times we really didn't have a lot of time to open up a question. So I wanted to make sure that we did this time around. Um, but the one key takeaway that I want to have for you, all of you is the environment we create communicates our beliefs about the people we serve. And this was uh, given by the National Center for Domestic Violence, Trauma and Mental Health. When you start a meeting and you start talking about, hey, we're interested in doing trauma-informed services. We really want to be known as a trauma-informed library. Here are some of the things. This We have a checklist of guidelines. And as you get to the environment section, you start talking about it. Before you start the meeting, I would like for you to like quote this and say, and make sure that every decision you make, it's based on something like this. The environment we create communicates our beliefs about the people we serve meaning every decision you make with regards to that environment that you're presenting to them shows them and tells that individual that walks into the door, I care about you without you having to physically say it. And with regards to environment, um, this particular presentation was very specific about physical environment. So I want to make sure that you got that um, very important. But we also need to be mindful of the environment, a welcoming environment that staff themselves introduce. So I would definitely go back to those previous presentations where I talk about ways of building relationships with individuals, where like a simple hello and a simple good morning can definitely be a welcoming environment to that individual. So if right now your agency doesn't have the funding to rearrange things in your library, but you want to address the well, welcoming environment for your patrons, then let's start working on training the staff on the basic conversation the basic relationship building like I said a simple smile a good morning can definitely go a long way and those are not expensive things and expensive ways of uh, creating that safe environment for individuals so um all right any questions I do want to open up to questions I am 100% available to anyone, even if it's not, um, maybe there's questions on the previous presentations that we had, um, but if anybody has any questions with regards to um, the trauma-informed or creating a trauma-informed library environment, I'm more than glad to 
um, to answer them. And also if anyone has uh, any comments, I would be more than glad to get them or to address them. All right, well, Gail, I will give this back to you. Doesn't seem like there's some questions. Um, if anybody's running or having any issues within their own library and they do not want to type it in the chat, so like it, let's say is a very library specific um, concern that you have, um, I believe I have my email. No, I don't. Um, but I can make sure that I have my email listed in the slides so that if you do want to reach out to me about a particular issue that it's at your library. And again, you don't want to put it out there because I do know that this is recorded. So I'm very well aware of everyone's safety and concerns. You're more than welcome to email me. I'm not attached to any library. So I would be more than glad to be a sounding board and try to support all of you through this. Um, if you are implementing a trauma-informed uh, library, I will say the next webinar is about that. So do not, and I know Gail is going to give you links and everything, um, but do not miss the next one because that one has more step-by-step -step process. If you are interested in implementing a trauma-informed um, approach at your library, and it includes more detailed information. Um, so be ready for that. Gail, it's all yours. Sounds good. <laughs> Thanks so much, Beatrice. This was a great session. Um, I've always been very interested in library space in general. So this was a definitely a different thing to be thinking about. So thank you so much. Appreciate that. And thank you all for your uh, good comments in uh, in the chat as well. And yeah, just have a great day and this will be on the lookout for the recording and uh, slides on the GELS LibGuide. That's good. Bye, everyone.